influence certain aspects of art production. Some of the questions we have been asking as starting point for this dialogue are, what influence have biennials had on art and art production in general? What is the role of site specificity inherent to the biennial and how does this affect art production in comparison with other exhibition venues such as institutions, museums and galleries? So with us today to discuss this subject, we are very, very lucky to have two of the most experienced practitioners in the area. Hans Ulrich Ubrist and Andri Salah have been working together on several occasions, for example, on the Tirana Biennial in Albania in 2003, for which they were both part of the curatorial team. The artist Andri Salah, whom you will know, I'm sure, because you might have seen him in Bergen Kunsthal as well in 2004, he has exhibited extensively throughout the world. Salah explores the interface of documentary and fiction. His works elicit an undercurrent tension that speaks to political and social realities. Salah has participated in a numerous of biennials, among others, the Gothenburg Biennial, the Moscow Biennial, the Sydney Biennial, the Berlin Biennial, the Tapay Biennial, Dakar Biennial, Tirana Biennial, Utopus, Albania Biennial, Istanbul Biennial, the Venice Biennial 2003-2001, 1999, Sao Paulo, 2002, Manifesta 4 and 3. So this guy should know what he's talking about. Hans Ulrich Ubrist will also be known to you uh, as you. Um, he uh, is a curator and art critic. He presently uh, serves as the co-director of exhibitions programs and director of international project at the Serpentine Gallery in London. He has curated over 150 exhibitions internationally since 1991, including Do It, Take Me, I'm Yours, Cities on the Move, Live, Life, Nuit Blanche, and the first Berlin Biennial, Manifesta One, and more recently, Uncertain States of America, and the first Moscow Triennial. Hans Ulrich Ubrist also has co-curated many monographic shows um, at the Musée du Art Moderne de la Ville de Paris. Obrist is also known for his many interviews with artists, which is going to also be performing here tonight, today. Uh, and more recently with curators published in a series of publications. We also have a reviewer here at this session, that is Marit Poske. She's an art historian, she actually studied here in Bergen, so somewhat she's a local in a way, we can say that. She's a curator and writer and lives now in Oslo. So, welcome Hans Ulrich Obrist and Andri Salah, the stage is yours. Thank you.
Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Solveig. Many thanks also to Mareike uh, and uh, Elena. We're very excited uh, to be here uh, in Bergen. And I was actually thinking when the plane landed this morning um, at my first visit ever in Bergen that it would be nice to maybe dedicate this to the memory of uh, Alain Rob Grier, the great French uh, novelist who was a very close friend. And uh, Alain Rob Grier has done an extraordinary project in this city in 1999, invited by Gunnar Kvaran when he actually curated a, an exhibition, um, starting from a very, very strange coincidence, which was uh, related actually to a painting, um, a quite obscure painting uh, from 1878 uh, by Eric Werenskjold, The Boy with the Geese. And it's actually this painting which the Rob Grier family uh, had a reproduction of in their home when Alain grew up, the great novelist and inventor of the Nouveau Roman. Uh, and it was then that their house burned down, and as Alan told me many times, it was actually this reproduction of this Bergen painting, which was the only thing which survived the fire, and for him became a very important trigger of this exhibition he did in Bergen, which he constituted almost like a novel, no? through uh, the collection. So I thought it would be nice to remember here Alain Rob Grier, who also told us always about the kind of little islands which you see when you approach uh, from the airport, and that whole archipelago notion in relation to to the Biennale will later also become maybe important in the discussion. Uh, in the conversation today, Andre and I thought it could be interesting to explore three projects which we've been working together and which are all deeply related, we think, to the question um, of how actually Biennales change art. Uh, we feel it's important to address that as a kind of a topic of production of reality. We feel that uh, biennales uh, need to produce reality. Uh, and that really has to do with something which for me was the kind of um, very, very beginning of curating when, as a teenager, uh, when I was kind of 17 or 18, I met the late Alighiero Boetti, uh, the visionary Italian artist, uh, conceptualist, art de povera artist. And he was telling me that as an artist, I mean, he was then already very much advanced in his trajectory, had been in the art for 30 years, and he was saying as an artist you're always invited to the same kinds of things. You're invited to do a gallery show, you're invited to do a museum show, you're invited to do a biennale, you're invited to do uh, sometimes a public commission, uh, an art fair, you know, all these very, very few formats which exist, of which the Biennale is one, which certainly since Boetti told me that more than 20 years ago, have become much, much more important, because at that time you maybe had 10 Biennales, and today uh, you've got more, far more than 100. So somehow what Boetti said is that he thinks it's very, very important that we think about this idea of what artists want to do, and that we don't squeeze practices into uh, existing format. And that really taught me this importance of experimentation, that it's not about a prescriptive way of doing exhibition, but that we actually mostly do remember exhibitions which also invent new rules of the game. And it's much, much later that the great poet Harry Matthews told me that it's actually these new rules of the game that very often bring in the idea of play and also a certain joy rather than chains, which I think has very much to do with the three projects we're going to present uh, today. So we thought in terms of production of reality that it could maybe be interesting uh, to begin with a project Andre and I curated in um, uh, Tirana and that, as you will see, has a lot to do with another project we did together in the context of uh, Utopia Station. So maybe ping and pong, and maybe Andre, we should start right away with the images of that Tirana project. So the, the first image was an image of one of many buildings that was uh, already painted by the mayor of the city, Edi Rama, who had started this project early in 2003, and so later in 2003 when the Tirana Biennial uh, was being organized again and were invited to um, curate a part of it, or you were invited and you invited me to curate it together. Um, I spoke with the mayor and we asked if we could have some of the buildings of the city which were still in their uh, rundown situation to have to, to be given to artists who would uh, propose a repainting of the, of the facade. And like this, it would be also a different input because so far the the buildings which were in Tirana were mainly painted by, by, by him, by the mayor, and also uh, like it was his project, and also because it became so popular and successful, sometimes you'd have new buildings which were built, and people, although it was new buildings, they would still paint them as, as if they were old and, and they had been painted to look better by, by the mayor. Um, 
So this building is the is the is one of the, the building which was given to Rikri Tiravanija. Um, that's at the very entrance of the city. That's the the project that he sent. And this is when it was with the scaffolding when it started to be to be prepared and painted. Uh, it was painted by the people by the of the of a company that normally paints the 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 buildings in the city. And with the same colors that were used also for the other for the other uh, buildings when the with the project of the mayor. So it's very cheap color and it's um, although it's been doing well so far. There is one thing that I liked about, especially this project, which was uh, also the, the the words. These are the things we are fighting for. Also, how it stands as a backdrop to a city where, after the changes, people started fighting for other things. So that was. It's, I think it, it it creates a very a, a very good backdrop to the everyday things that you see people fighting for. There's a building for Dominique uh, that was given to Dominique Gonzalez Foster. And what she proposed is to use all the bits of colors that had remained from the, from the other projects and make paint a line with each of them. This was, all these photos are 2003 and this is 2009, this is later. Part of, of this project, which is connected to Biennial, but was also connected with what the, 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 the mayor had been doing, was while there was a huge reconstruction of the infrastructure and of the streets and all this kind of like everlasting dirt, what was, um, was to offer a, a kind of diversion to the, to, the, to the everyday reality. So that's how the first building started and that's how also this buildings continue. So now you can see that in a way they, they look very differently in the same place where they used to be because the context has changed. This is the building uh, for which Liam Gillick made a proposal, and that's the building. That's a building that Olafur Eliasson worked on, which as you can see is next to a building of the projects painted by the mayor. That's a project, that's a building. This is always 2003, and now it's 2009. And, uh, there is this nowadays, like this week, there is the, the, the newest edition of the Tirana Biennial, and I, this is one picture I managed to get because they are, there are four or five buildings which are being painted. I don't have the, the names of the new artists, but somebody sent me a picture, so this is one of the, one of the that's a picture from yesterday. So it's the beginning of, a, of another project. So it's only just begun, and I think that's also what uh, is one of the things which I remember we discussed actually at the very beginning when we, um, when we did this project, which was really this idea of uh, what remains of a Biennale, you know, and the idea of um, very often, and I mean, both Andre and I by that time had already done many Biennales, had been involved in many Biennales, and we had observed that there is very much something of the switch on, switch off modality kind of involved. Every two years with a Biennale or every three years with a Triennale, there is a big event and then it's all gone. Um, as we can see mainly with many even of the very historic Biennales, very little remains. I mean even as Harald Seemann always used to say, the model of all Biennales, the, the Biennale in Venice, has never really had layers of sedimentation. There is no collection. Nothing remains of this extraordinary history. It's just the flame which pops up every two years, and then it's all gone again. And we felt uh, intuitively and very strongly that given our times and the necessity of maybe ever increasingly limited resources on the planet, that 
we should switch away from this idea of uh, event culture and try to come up with models of Biennales which have maybe more to do with sustainability and also with legacy. And so that the Biennale obviously creates a focus and creates an emphasis and creates maybe also something of critical mass where a lot of people come to town, but that something remains afterwards which can organically grow. And for us, this project, uh, I remember very well uh, when Henri told me the first time about this idea that the mayor was actually, and the mayor himself being an artist uh, and being Henri's oldest friend, it's obviously very, very interesting that the mayor started to paint himself these buildings. He really used the city. It's almost like this Mayakovsky idea that the streets are like his palettes, no? And, uh, uh, and so then when our suggestion came that we would invite artists and sort of make a group show, he was very open to that. Now, this year with the Biennale, the curators, as Henri said, have decided to continue this model, and it might very well be that in the future Henri and I continue this. So it's, no, it's no. early days, we can say. We should continue. <laughs> yeah, we discussed this this morning, actually, in Bergen, that we should do, again, more with it. And one of the things which is interesting, Andre, is that actually parallel to that, I remember it didn't grow out of, somehow out of the blue, because it had a lot to do with you actually starting to film that whole process already earlier. And it was the beginning, really, of Dami Colori, no? All right. Well, that, that also connects with, uh, with another biennial uh, and with the Utopia station, which was part of the Venice biennial. And this is the Dami Colori, which, which connects to this project because it was uh, a film on the on the, the a city which was being transformed by the by the color. Uh, it, the city wasn't named, but now we know it's Tirana. And when I was invited to participate in this in the Utopia station, I was thinking of the idea of Utopia in this background where I come from and uh, from Albania, where it's a, the things are not a matter of Utopia, but it's a, or not, but it's a matter of, of hope or not, which is something which could could be at least uh, to, to start with. You start with hope, and then you eventually to develop utopias. So I was thinking of, instead of answering to the idea of, of utopia, it would be to answer to the idea of hope and if, if such thing um, is possible or how one can switch it on so that it's possible again. And where Utopia Station was interesting to me is that it was, again to this creating reality thing, it was the, the, the reason why I did start working on, on the film Dummy Colori. So I was thinking of how to uh, what would be my response to this um, community of people who bring ideas about utopia? And I was feeling a little bit like a, a cheater if I would give some idea and proposal about utopia while I was coming from this background where the question is the hope. Um, in Poughkeepsie, we met, and I remember at that time, uh, after everybody, like everybody was talking and, and discussing this idea of utopia, and I simply showed the film. I had only started filming at night the city, and I was showing only these parts of the city, like long travelings without any comment or even without sound at all. And I remember uh, Liam, which also becomes the beginning of the film, as was Liam at the end asking me that he didn't believe that I had a, a mayor friend who was an artist and that was a city which existed. But to come back to the, to the thing I found interesting because at least at my, at my experience was uh, as an artist, not as an artist curator, that was the only biennial that I that helped me, pro I mean, helped me not financially, but that it pushed me, it triggered me to do something, to produce something. So, in a way, my question about it comes to is something is, is, is worth or is fit or is just and right, whether it helps trigger something, produce something that otherwise it could not exist without that. And in a way, for me, it's, uh, I'm not so much talking about the, the group shows, because the group shows you have a work and it fits to the context, you say yes, but what I think is interesting about ideas like by the biennial or the idea of Nuit Blanche, for example, which I've never participated, is that every time I was invited, the question is, do I need this, this energy or do I need this platform or do I need this event to produce a new idea, and when I mean produce, is in the idea of the, to be triggered to think of something, not so much in the idea of taking the camera and shooting something. So that was always the, the for what for me, Utopia Station, uh, in my own experience, was different from the, from, the, from the other biennials. And it had also to do, I mean, a lot with the Tirana project, because here again, these are things which would never have happened without uh, these 
painted houses would never have happened without this project in, uh, in Tirana. It's just something the artists would never have done. And then obviously the question is always a question of avoiding instrumentalization because uh, would you know, that be a project which wouldn't have fallen on the motivation of the artists if there wouldn't have been a desire from the artists to do that? It could have easily gone very wrong. This idea that you know, a city would ask artists to paint houses, it could become a cheap trick of city branding, right? And that yeah. would be the flip side. But it was the opposite because it had to do with a genuine story of uh, the friendship of the mayor, the artist mayor and Henri, then Henri and me co-curating this show, talking to the artist, the artist for them it being a dream, this idea that they would, you know, do a house and have a building which then would be theirs to some extent, it would, it would stay there, it would be a long-term uh, project. Uh, so to some extent it's got a lot to do with this idea really of uh, a very strong involvement of artists and uh, a desire also of, uh, of artists and that's I think what ties probably these pro two projects, Utopia Station and also the Tirana um, uh, project uh, together uh, and in this sense is not an idea that um, uh, one would just uh, instrumentalize and get works uh, for a context to sort of illustrate certain proposals. It's the opposite of illustration, no? It's more, and that's, it's not representation, it's not illustration, it's kind of production of, uh, uh, of, uh, of reality. And that's why very often it's interesting also and urgent to involve artists not only in the dialogue and in the conversations, um, which means that one doesn't talk to the artist at the end, you know, one sort of comes up with a great concept of a biennale, a great theme, and then goes to see the artist. But sort of, uh, in my case, it very often starts with a conversation with the artist, and very often even more so than that, it's a co-curating with an artist. So the uh, Tirana project is co-curated by Andre and me, so I think it's always very interesting when an artist the curator form a team of uh, curating. And in uh, Venice, it was actually an next step, uh, which was really uh, uh, a sort of a trialogue between Molly Nesbitt, Ricky Tirabanisha, and myself. And it happened because uh, we were invited together with uh, five, six other curators by Francesco Bonami to curate something for the Venice Biennale. And the idea was, uh, and that was an interesting model uh, which was proposed to us, was that the Biennale would be broken down into kind of temporary autonomous units. So it wouldn't be a kind of a one, you know, overwhelming kind of uh, a one kind of master plan, but it would more, and that leads us back to the, you know, what Rob Grier observed when he landed in Bergen, the little islands, the archipelago. And that's something which uh, Edouard Lisson very often says could be a great model for Biennale, that it's not like continents or rocks, which is kind of solid or imposing, but it's more like archipelagos, which is welcoming and sheltering. Um, uh, and in this sense, uh, you know, uh, these different uh, archipelagos were really autonomous exhibitions. And we were invited, each of us, to do such a show. And um, it was late at night in Venice that in the bar, Recruit and I thought, why don't we team up and join forces? Um, and we were somehow, because we always wanted to do a show together, and I was asking Rickrit what he was doing at that time, and he was saying he was doing stations. Um, and he was saying what I was doing, and I was saying I had just spoken to Molly Nesbitt, the art historian, the eminent art historian, and she and I would do a book on Utopia. And it was really through that kind of chance encounter almost, that station and Utopia, Utopia and station, Utopia station was born, and we felt it would be very interesting Utopia being the known place to think about what could be a station for Utopia and it also be a, uh, um, an opportunity and a necessity to think about what could be the social contract of art. I mean, Utopia Station was a possibility for us to ask what could be a social contract for art for the late 20, early 21st century. And we then started to talk to um, a lot of artists and architects and different practitioners. Uh, Henri mentioned Puxkipsi. Uh, I can never pronounce it. It's uh, where Wasser College is, where Molly Nesbitt teaches. And we had a gathering there where basically from Leon Golub to Hans Hake to Liam Gillick to Henri to Rickrit to Philippe Areno to Pierre Wieck to many artists. I mean, there were about 30, 40 participants, if I remember well, all gathered together with Rickrit, Molly and me and discussed not only the idea of Utopia Station, but also showed to each other first ideas and sketches of what might happen. And that, I think, was for me an incredibly um, uh, productive and also beautiful experience, because, for example, Andre showing to his colleagues and, and friends and artist colleagues the first sketch of Dami Colori, because it also creates a kind of a feedback loop, which was very, very interesting. So it's not just like with the group show, that everybody would come with his or her piece and then meet at the opening. No, but it sort of organically grows. And here, I think, is the drawing Rick made of the station. 
Yeah, that's a drawing of the station in, in Venice. That's the insemination the of the... The back, yeah. ...in the vaporetta. That's the poster, Recruit Design. And then we had a poster project, so we, we invited uh, 100 artists to do posters for the station. These posters were like an autonomous poster show, and they were shown all over the world. They were somehow inspired by a visit, uh, um, actually, um, Molly Nesbitt made to Mumbai, when she uh, uh, actually saw a lot of uh, um, political and social projects using posters in an exhibition and brought a lot of photographs, so we thought it could be very interesting to have these poster projects in, uh, in the show. Here again, uh, a drawing of Recruit of the, of the station, which was like a very big uh, catwalk, one could say. It was a horizontal uh, structure um, where the different artist projects were somehow um, uh, fit in. So it wasn't you know, an a priori master plan once more, where everything had to fit in, but Rickrit listened to every artist's project and then drew a structure into which all these projects could actually be interwoven. I think that's the word in English, weaving in, interwoven. We have somewhere, we have a drawing, I think, of the, of the floor plan, no? Of, the, of Venice. Yeah. That's the garden. The garden was a, a sort of a performative space, and there was Martha Rosler had her, uh, her project there, and uh, maybe that's it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, here you have the, the floor plan, and uh, it became really a, a, a project which, which somehow uh, was activated throughout the Biennale, so it was also not the idea that uh, you know, everybody would leave after the opening, but it was something which, uh, here, Leon Golub's last work, um, it's the very last work he did in his life, which is uh, basically No to Utopia and Utopia Yes, which became the banner uh, of the exhibition. Here, Martha Roslos, that was Martha Roslos' uh, kind of temporary autonomous uh, zone. She worked with a whole group of students um, in, in the, what we call the Utopia Station Park. And he, then it went to Munich, where it became our tower, in the Haus der Kunst. Um, so also this idea that you know, a Biennale becomes an exhibition, that it's not over once the Biennale, because very, Biennales very seldomly travel. Um, usually, you know, it's very, very rare that the Biennale travels, whilst exhibitions actually do travel every now and then. Uh, and there is a huge potential in this idea of uh, um, uh, an exhibition changing whilst it travels. So not... It it might help the, also the framing of, of, of such an event in time, like in the sense of here it was a Biennale which became an exhibition which travelled, or it didn't become, it was at the same time an exhibition which travelled, or in Tirana it was painting of facades that that stayed even after the Biennale, and for the, the majority of the people there, they are not connected to the Biennial at mm -hmm. all. So in a way, there is this kind of, uh, um, like a loser structure with a leaking. So it leaks towards something else. And I think in the sense of Tirana, it wasn't like a, because it did not respond to a necessity or a political or culture necessity thought by people who are organized, but simply the, it's a project of a few people who really want to see this Biennale to happen and to have something, some kind of diversion to, to the everyday life. And it's, it's a way for them to, to, to accommodate their, why they are still living in that place. Uh, and it does not connect so much to this situation where you do Biennale, people come to see Biennale, the people leave Biennale closes. So it, this not, this, uh, left open biennial, in a way. And I think it's the same thing with the, with the Utopia station, that it was a left open biennial too. Yeah, totally left open, but also you, I remember you said when we worked on these uh, two shows, that you coined this thing, I've quoted ever since, that you thought that a biennale would be about different layers of input in the city or on the city. Maybe it's interesting to talk a little bit more about that, because I think it's true for both cases, no? That there is these sort of layers and layers of, of input. But in a way, I see, I see it also connected to the way to 
the, the way finally how I work, which is not so much about having goals which finalize into one thing, but hopefully there are steps from, from one step to the other. For example, um, like I said, I started working on Dami Colori, for example, and it was because of the Utopia station and with this meeting in, in uh, Poughkeepsie. So it wasn't at all about representing Tirana or representing something. And actually, from there to go, jump a little bit earlier is that when I thought of, of doing this uh, interview and this part of the film with, uh, with a friend of mine who is the mayor, it was never about showing what he did, but it was because I learned from him that when he asked uh, after the first buildings were painted and there was a huge reaction, and then he made a, a poll and he asked these two questions to the, to the people in this poll. And the first question was, do you like it? And the second question uh, was, do you want this to continue? And to the first question, it was 60% of people said they like it and 40% of the people didn't like it. But to the second question, do you want it to continue? 90% of the people said yes and 10% of people said no. So in a way for me, this film was to make a film about this 30% of people like, what is it for this, with these people that they don't like what they see, but they want it to continue? So at the end, it's not about color, but there must be something behind the color. So in a way, I'd like to, this is a kind of ricochet answering to this idea of the layers, that there is a, another layer behind the layer. And for some people, you, you like to communicate with some people, you have to focus on this other layer. And with other people, it's with the previous layer. And, and uh, yeah, and this is another way to see what I said this, keep it open, um, by, uh, like open biennial. A memory maybe has also to do with it in some kind of way, because one of the things I was actually thinking this morning is thinking about the more than 100 Biennale we have at the moment. If we think back over the last, you know, 20 years, what are the Biennales we have seen and what are the Biennales we remember, it's very interesting, you know, where memory does occur. And Richard Hamilton once told me that we only remember exhibitions which also invent a display feature which I think is a very interesting statement. Uh, it's not always maybe true, but it's true very, very often. I mean, we do remember um, uh, Duchamp's surrealism exhibitions in Paris and New York, of course, because of its exhibits, but also because of the display features they invented. Something Elena Filipovic is an expert, uh, and it's actually very wonderful that uh, the dialogue with Elena, um, who is one of the three curators here uh, uh, in Bergen, started with Utopia Station, because she was working with uh, uh, Rikrit, um, uh, Molly, Amri, me and all the artists on this uh, um, on this exhibition. So the display feature is one thing, and that's why for Utopia Station, Recrit developed a display feature for, for Venice, which is this very uh, astonishing structure, an enormous horizontal structure made out of wood, which with a lot of revolving doors uh, uh, opening into, into, uh, into other rooms. Uh, he developed then for Munich, uh, we have some images of Munich, a tower. So the whole uh, project in Munich uh, followed actually even more a time code than it was in, in Venice. In Venice, it was really about to be activated, so by weekly dialogues, by weekly discussions. We had Edouard Glissant there. We, I mean, we invited um, our thinkers. We felt were very important to think the project. Bruno Latour was there one week. Uh, Tony Negri was there. But we, we also um, uh, had then in Munich a real program which altered daily. To give you an example, so the program became more and more complex and really the, the exhibition became a kind of a time code or a time protocol, one could say. So for example, every day at 4 p.m. before the film of Pierre Week would be screened, a cake would be served to all the visitors present. So that, you know, there was a, a kind of a, um, uh, a time code uh, involved. And that, that's something which Rickrit really picked up with his display in, uh, uh, in, in Munich. The tower became a very kind of compressed, dense structure uh, of time coding. Uh, and was also a reaction, obviously, to a very different architecture which, uh, than there was. So that's one thing, to invent a new uh, uh, display feature. The other thing, I think, which produces maybe memorable uh, or things we might not forget is certainly this idea of Boiti, that ex we do remember exhibitions which produce a new rule of the game. Uh, uh, and 
The third thing which I think Andre okay. emphasized is this idea that he produces a work or works, um, extraordinary works, like in this case Dami Colori, uh, which then are kind of associated with this context which has produced it. But I'm sure there are many, many more. Uh, since you are talking about this idea of something which develops in time and the format of time being the frame of the exhibition, maybe it's interesting also to take as example, although it's not a biennial, but it could have been a, a perfectly p possible format of a biennial. The, the Il Tempo del Postino, the, the, what we between us call the opera project. Maybe you... Yeah, I wondered if we, could, we try to download some images. I don't know if that, right, uh, yeah. if, if that worked. We had, a, we had a problem this morning actually with our transmission of the files. So we we're going to check if they yeah, work. Yeah, Otherwise, no, we're we just going to describe some, it to you. Some, uh, and Tempo del Postino, and it will be great to hear Henri in a minute speak about, about his uh, extraordinary piece for, for Tempo del Postino. But to give you a little bit a framework of what the show was, it was really an exhibition dedicated to our friend, the late English architect Cedric Price, who has been one of architects' most influential figures since the founding of his office in London in the 1960s. And it's interesting that actually none of the artists invited to our show had been born when Cedric started to work on the Fun Palace in 1960, 1961, which for us remains the most important transdisciplinary cultural complex for theatre art invented in the 20th century and which remains unrealized. So we imagined that an event like Tempo del Postino would have been hosted in such a structure uh, and actually Cedric's sort of whole focus on time-based building that would disappear after a limited lifespan rather than on finished building made him legendary. Price was convinced that buildings should be flexible enough to allow the occupier to adapt the building to serve the needs of the moment which reflects very much his belief that the time is the first dimension of design. Um, so the idea of time. The Fun Palace was supposed to be a, a large mechanistic shipyard in which actually, depending on changing situations, many structures could be built uh, from above. It will probably look like nothing on Earth from the outside, Cedric Price once you know, described it. So Tempo del Postino, which was a project uh, Philippe Pareno and I curated, so again, it's a project curated in collaboration with an artist, is a time-based exhibition. Uh, where we invited artists uh, actually to propose an art piece, a tableau, so to speak, that will be visible for a limited moment. It's a collection of time-based works, uh, and in this sense we can see Tempo del Postino as an experiment in, in time coding. When he, did the future, or when he wrote the Futurological Congress in 71, the great Polish uh, science fiction writer Stanislav Lem wrote about the future as a peripatetic vision of knowledge formation in which global constituencies converge and disperse at once sharing information and developing new models of post-symbolic communication. Uh, a sentence very important for Philippe Pareno for the Tempo del Postino idea. The title comes really from the Italian postman's time. Tempo del Postino means postman time in Italian, but it actually means two different things in French. Uh, factor is a factor, like for a mathematical operation or a computer language programming, but factor also means uh, in French, the factor is the postman, the person who delivers the mail. And the postman is obviously then also the person who delivers information. So here we go. Uh, we felt Tempo de Postino as a proposal to visit an exhibition space without moving. So it's a journey through a museum without moving, where each of the artists appear next to each other rather than with each other, according to an old idea of time sharing. But nevertheless, they still constitute a subject, raising once more the question of a collective, um, a polyphony of voices, really, as one uh, subject. And we have here a couple of images of the pieces. That's Liam. Yeah, uh, this is the piece of Liam Gillick, which is a piano playing the, uh, itself the sound, which was also the signal for the Portuguese revolution. And at the same time, was, the piano was there that whenever, if anything went wrong technically with, uh, with the whole performance, uh, the piano would start playing automatically. At the end, we managed to have the piano play only in the beginning and the end, which was a, a sign of... <laughs> we must say that um, that was in big parts uh, thanks to Henri, because actually, um, when the show went to Basel, Henri and Rikrit joined Philippe and me as curators of the project, so it became uh, a, a curatorial team of the four of us. That's the thing I forgot yeah. to mention before. That's the piece of, of Doug Eitken. Uh, Carson Holler with the experiment with the, with the people who live with the mirror and 
um, for one week and see everything upside down. My piece with, uh, with the butterflies where uh, there, it's a duet of Madame Butterfly that I took from. It's only a duet in the opera, and instead of having one uh, soprano to, to, for the role of the butterflies, it was eight sopranos, and instead of having one um, uh, baritone for Pinkerton, it was two. So, but in a way, and they were all the time lip singing, like singing at the same time, but they were letting the voice only in very precise moments. So, at the end, there was still a duo, only two voices being heard, but the voice was traveling through different bodies, so to say. Um, Olafur's work, it was uh, the orchestra would react as, as an echo to any sound or noise coming from the, from, from the audience, from the public. Philippe Arenos, where the ventriloquist uh, introduced the whole idea of the show, and therefore, you could hear him, but you, could, you wouldn't see him um, talk about it. Pierre Wieck. I think, in general, what is interesting, uh, another interesting link, you correct me if I'm forcing it, but between, between Tempo de Postino, since we're talking about it today, and, and the, the project in Tirana, is the relation to, to um, the experience. Because there is one thing which, where is an inherent uh, contradiction in the idea of the biennial is that experiencing a biennial does not go with the experiencing of the individual works. Because there is, I mean, when we think of hopefully in a biennial there are very good works and there are many of them, it's impossible to experience properly such strong works, more than 10 of them a day, and the biennial comes with many more than, than with many tens of works. So how it's possible to experience individual works? Um, now I wouldn't talk here about the, some kind of. Sometimes there is a, a problem between, say, organizers and the artists and how technically the things look. But I'm, uh, I'm I'm talking about the real experience of the work. So how it's possible to experience the work and yet experience the biennial? So. Or is, it, is there a possibility to bring together such a contradiction, such things that do not go with each other? And I think, in a strange way, um, the project in Tirana does bring this because it, it expands in a much longer time and people experience it in, in a different way, connection to time and space. And Il Tempo de Postino, uh, whether people would like or not like it, it's still it's very much based on the experience because you experience each work after one after the other. Um, so, in a, in a way, the works are not there simply as, as, uh, as icebergs, that only the, the top of it would look in the biennials, but they would be, they would be there as fully shown icebergs. So, that's the, the way how I would talk about it. So, there is this thing about the, 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 the experience that I find uh, maybe interesting to, to talk or to simply throw there and see if it's interesting, interesting for everyone, but how one can talk of experience in a biennial and what does it mean and what does it, what does it mean to the artwork and are we talking of the experience of the biennial or the experiencing of the artwork? Um, yeah, I think that's key, you know, because it's key also because, again, with the Biennale, very often it's become a kind of a, a routine scheme that you've got 50 or 60 or 70 artists, um, a, a big number, kind of, and very often see those 50, 60, 70 works in a, I mean, as Andre said, in a time frame of a day where you just cannot make 50, 60 or 70 uh, experiences or, or strong experiences. And it's maybe interesting actually because this is a reflection I think here as far as I had understood uh, in terms of the, uh, the brainstorming of these sessions here about um, uh, really what are current necessities and, 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 and urgencies for Biennales. And uh, I mean, one thing which is interesting about Tempo de Postino is maybe the, the kind of situation where it was produced, because it actually happened in Manchester um, uh, before then going to Basel this year. Um, and uh, the story is quite extraordinary because the mayor of Manchester understood 
a couple of years ago that maybe Manchester isn't uh, necessarily so important for music and art as at a certain moment it was, and uh, because obviously it was an incredible leader for, for music and everything related to music and clubbing, etc. Um, and wanted to bring you know, Manchester back on the map. So he made a very, very interesting move and appointed the designer and artist, the legendary designer and artist, and, uh, um, and actually uh, curator Peter Saville, uh, uh, to be. Um, cultural advisor, almost cultural minister, one could say, to the city of Manchester. And that is obviously a very, very rare instance that a mayor would do that. Peter Saville has a, an office in Manchester. He goes there one day a week. So it's not like that he's just giving an idea every now and then, but he really is part of every discussion, you know, goes there. There is even a hotel room named after him, a Peter Saville Suite in the hotel in Manchester. So it's very anchored, you know, in the city. Uh, and he came up with lots of ideas, you know, as, a, as an artist and designer of what Manchester needs. And one of the things which he came up with was this uh, wonderful idea that one could do, and it's actually, it ties in very much with uh, what Henri said, but it ties in also with what Alighiero Boetti told me a long time ago, that we think about what could one produce, how could one help artists to produce things they, can, they cannot produce elsewhere. How ca could one actually create a situation where extraordinary things could happen which otherwise would remain unrealized. So they founded this festival, um, the Manchester International Festival, um, appointed a director, the extraordinary Alex Poots, so one of the, the great you know, visionary uh, 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 festival organizers with a big focus on music and theater. And uh, it was at this very moment that they started to every second year do a festival where in all different disciplines, in music, in theater, uh, in art, uh, in dance, they would realize projects which you know, otherwise wouldn't have happened and which would always be a world premiere. And uh, we had this, uh, Philip and I, together with Henri and Rikrit and all the artists in the show, we had had this project to do actually a time-based group show for a very, very long time. We, I would say it started around 2000 when we did the show with Philip uh, at the Musée d'Art Moderne and it was also the time when Henri and I met at mm -hmm. the very beginning of, of 2000, at the very end of the 90s. And we can really say that uh, at that moment the idea was somehow born to do an exhibition which, where artists would be given time and not space. But we went from theatre to theatre, from city to city and just didn't find the context where we could produce these things. So we went to see, you know, Gérard Mortier and all kinds of great, you know, theatre and opera impresarios and they all found it very interesting, but they say we cannot produce it. And it was only when this unique constellation happened in Manchester with Peter Saville, with Alex Poots, that all of a sudden, you know, reality could be produced. So I think it's a very interesting model from which maybe we can learn for the Biennale discussion somehow in terms of how reality can be produced, no? Because I suppose there would be many, many other possible festivals and biennales where projects could be realized, which otherwise... And that leads me to a question, Henri, what are your unrealized projects? <laughs> Should I say? Um, no, it makes me sad thinking of that I have unrealized projects. <laughs> Maybe, I don't know, maybe we should open it for... Yeah, a coffee break, maybe? Yes. We'll have a break now of, let's say, 10 minutes, and stretch your leg, and then you come back, and we will have open session here with discussion. I hope you all participate. And we'll finish up around 6, 6.30. The presentation of the different okay. things. So, um, before we open up for questions, uh, the panel here would like to talk a little bit more 
and then we include you all in the discussion. Yeah, thank you very much. Just um, we thought it could be interesting a few minutes before. Sorry, it's me. <laughs> it could be interesting before we open it to the floor to um, address that uh, question of the unrealized project. Uh, and obviously, what it has to do with when I ask Henry if he has any, any unrealized project, there are kind of lots of possibilities, obviously, and I've asked him this question many times before. It's my most recurrent question in my interviews, and there can be projects which are utopic and simply unrealizable. To the point that it's surprising that somebody comes unprepared to answer it. <laughs> And then there are the projects which are forgotten. And then there is, you know, Doris Lessing says there are the unrealized projects because one just doesn't do them. There. And she said there are the self sense of books, no, the books one wouldn't write. So there's a huge complex of unrealized projects. But maybe we can address it from a more pragmatic level. And I was just really curious to hear from Henri what's the kind of thing you've so far not produced you'd, you'd like to do. What could the context I mean, there, yeah, do for you? Yeah, yeah. Like, among the ones that I would like to realize that don't need the, 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 the usual format of preparing them and doing them, which are in the relation between, say, an artist and its collaborators, or artist and the gallery, or artist and, and a show in a museum. It could be, I don't know, it would be, for example, expanding this, the, the project for Il Tempo del Postino, the one with the opera, which I only did this like a pilot thing of one aria and expanding into a full opera, for example, which would mean working uh, with the opera house and um, yeah, which is again like using a format that otherwise you don't you don't have the possibility, and that's not the kind of usual um, way you you produce. So, so that's what the, a, full well, that's evening, what, a full evening, a full evening, yeah, like a, a one, yeah. That, yeah. So I think, for example, that's what. Uh, Bergen could do. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's a great moment to open it to the floor. Okay, questions? Thank you so much. Um, how much should I identify myself? Caroline Jones. And I'm just so interested in your ending with experience. And it brings us back to the question of the session which is how has the recurrent biennial structure perhaps changed art? And there are two ways I want to throw this at you, and it's appropriate because both of you have worked in the French context very often, and experience is both experiment, and of course it is the more Germanic notion of the personal experience of the, of the viewer and the visitor. Manifestly, there are many, many artists who are not biennial artists who feel almost bitter about this. They like to be in a studio, make an object, and send it out into the world. They are left out of this. So in a sense, I want to challenge you to reflect on when this may have happened. So for an art historian, I'd, I'd be fascinated in Hans Ulrich's view. I would imagine it's around Aperto and Zeman and you know these moments when you turn your back on the salon with its movable objects and you, you try to create a different kind of opportunity. But then on the other end of that, what has the effect been? Are we now exhausting artists by demanding that they produce an experience or an experience, right? So that's my, that's my question. Yeah, where did it all start? I mean, obviously the, the Biennale has been around for a long time and uh, uh, when I started to be in the art world uh, in the late 80s um, as a student you know there were, was a very limited number of biennale there was uh, five six biennales which mattered and they were mostly all in the west uh, and very few of them also in the south with the exception of maybe Sao Paulo um, and obviously what has happened ever since is uh, and ever increasingly is that the art world has become an increasing polyphony of centers. Um, and I think somehow that is the key thing the Biennales have helped to shape. Uh, and I think uh, even if maybe there are today many problems with the Biennale, we should always credit the Biennales for the multiplication of Biennales for having done that. Um, and uh, it's got to do a lot, I think, with this idea, I mean, 
Kaspar König did an exhibition called Westkunst, which remains one of the most important exhibitions of the 20th century, where he really summarized the art after World War II to the then very young Franz West, that was somehow Pollock to West somehow, from the 45 really to, to, uh, um, to the early 80s when the show took place as a moment of, of Western art. Um, and I think that ever since there have been many, many other contexts who became incredibly important. And it's maybe a little bit what Fernand Brodel says in uh, The Long Duration, we've got seismic shifts. And I think that particularly what has happened in the East uh, uh, over the last 20 years is such a Brodellian kind of seismic shift and has been very much uh, driven also by these uh, biennales. And I think the biennales have been instrumental and very important by actually also uh, breaking that sort of hegemony of Western art and uh, much more than the museums in the first place. Now it's the museums as well, but it was really driven you know, by, the, by the biennales. Um, and, uh, and I think that that's something which uh, um, is incredibly relevant. Then there is obviously all the forces of homogenization, which were somehow at stake. And I think the risk is, and that obviously leads to the fact that there might be such a thing as Biennale artists or Biennale curators, something we, we always try to, to resist, um, is that there is something like you know, a homogenizing dimension, that maybe Biennale start to resemble each other, that maybe curators start to look at previous Biennales to make their list, and it becomes all the kind of you know, same thing. And I think from that point of view, we can learn a lot from Edouard Glissant and his sort of whole idea of how he tells us that we can cope with globalization and maybe actually define what he calls mondialité, a, a, a global dialogue which produces difference. So what could be a biennale today which produces difference, um, which uh, uh, yet at the same time does not refute or refuse the incredible potential of a global dialogue, so which engages in a global dialogue yet produces difference. And one of the things I think is absolutely key is that each time it's a completely new situation, um, which starts from the idea of what a specific context needs. And from that point of view, it's not at all the routine. And for that reason, I mean, I've done maybe 12, 13, 14 biennales uh, so far, and I'm not the biennale curator because I'm foremost the museum curator, and the biennale has always been my part-time activity, what I do on weekends. Uh, and uh, so I've always done kind of one, one a year, no? And it's been incredibly important for my museum work. It's a complementarity. It's sort of, you know, in both directions. The museum work influences the Biennale work. The Biennale work influences the museum work. And none of these Biennales, I hope, you know, have repeated each other. I mean, Henri and I have shown you a few examples. They have a lot of things in common. We might talk about that later. Uh, what they have in common, they have in common among other things that they don't occupy thousands of square meters, they think space and time uh, differently. But I think other biennales we haven't shown today, I mean, for example, when Klaus Biesenbach, Nancy Specht and I did the first Berlin Biennale, we decided, we were so excited by what was happening in Berlin, we thought no to plane tickets. We just decided, let's only look at Berlin, let's make a mapping, and that was 99, let's make a mapping of what is Berlin in 99, and the show was called Berlin Berlin, so it's homage to Pontus Hulten with Paris Moscow, you know, Paris Berlin, Paris, New York. Uh, so the show Berlin Berlin was really a mapping, a purely local mapping, and obviously artists from all over the world, Henri has lived in Berlin for several years, but already in 99, artists from all over the world had lived there, and not only recently, but also through the DAD much, much earlier. Um, when we did the Guangzhou Triennale with Hu Han Ru, um, we felt that it would be very important that in Guangzhou there would be a kind of a Kunsthalle type of structure, which is permanent before and after the Triennale. So we set up a real contact zone where local and global artists could, ex could, could have a dialogue. So we brought artists like um, Fischli Weiss or Dan Graham for the first time to China and brought them in a contact with the artists in China so that the real dialogue would have happened. And when we did the Yokohama Triennale last year, we realized um, with my colleagues that there was an increasing desire for non-mediated experience. So we've invited every artist to do an exhibit, but also do a performance. And if you compare, you know, the artist lists and the rules of the game and the way how these shows work, you know, they hopefully never repeat each other. I think to some extent, routine is not only the enemy of Biennales, routine is the enemy of exhibition in, in general.
We have the question from the break. There was one question from the break. I don't see now. Maybe it was answered yeah. during the break. Yeah. Henri answered it. Maybe Henri, do you want to? <laughs> Could you repeat the question and then Henri can answer it? No, but it was mainly asked to Henri. But we. Yeah, the person got the answer and left, so that's good. <laughs> but <laughs> <laughs> but just, just before the other question comes, like just a, a, a small adding to, to, to the question. I, I don't think the. I mean, maybe I'm repeating what I was saying a bit before, but I don't think the that the biennials are bringing the experiencing of the work. So I'd rather say, for example, when you'd mention, for example, that video is very much used in the, in the biennials, which is very true, by the way. And actually it's interesting because it, it looks like there is the same middle age crisis happening to video and biennials at the same time, but for, for now there is no conference whether should we video or should we not video. <laughs> but the, 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 the thing is that there is nothing wrong probably about it. It can be fine that both of them are there, but that it's not about experiencing like in the biennials. I have the feeling very often it's about bringing news and it's about bringing issues or new issues uh, or bringing news from, from places that otherwise you would not visit them. And, and in a way, this is, I totally understand how it could make some very good artists or artists in general be unhappy about it because there is, it loses this, the right balance which only the experience of a work could bring between content and form because you start to have so much of this poor form that somehow it's not, we don't even realize it because you don't know where it's the, the poorness of the form of the artwork that stops and that starts and where is the bad installation that starts, like the bad installing of that work that starts. So it really blurs the, 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 the lines in that sense. Um, I think that's, that's the, the and that's a fact that there are so often as long as it's a video which brings news or information or an issue, a problem from some part of the world and it's put in eight channels instead of a single channel, which is again another blurring of some form, formal quality of film and video because uh, there is no aesthetic commitment to the editing, for example. There is not a, so that's where the problem starts, so how come there, those works are so present in the Bayanias? which they are. On the other side, if the biennial and the experience of the artwork would go together, really, then I would say that we would also have a lot of drawing and a lot of sculptures because it's not that these people are close in their studios and they don't want to be part of this as if it was a game. Uh, I think it's rather because maybe the mediating of their work does not go through informing people about other places. It's just about experiencing their, their work and that's what the biennial Maybe it's not, it's not the biennial strongest point to, to, to cherish and to develop and even emancipate whatever is experienced in the art, in the contemporary art. But it rather develops what is the communicative power of, of contemporary art or part of it, not uh, all of it. And it's obviously, I mean, one could go on, we could go on hours, your question is very fascinating, so we could, uh, it, it's difficult to stop talking about, you know, to, to try to answer it, because I think one could also go into that whole thing of objects or non-objects, you know, in, in, in relation to that, and something, you know, Tino Segal talks a lot about, uh, just in an email we exchange I had with him, uh, he, he, he said um, uh, uh, this whole idea that maybe actually um, a notion of art that was generated by the material of art, sculpture and painting in the early 19th century and was fully articulated and established by the 60s is detaching itself from its material origin and venturing into other realms. And obviously um, museum collections still in very big parts are about objects and uh, uh, it's very, very dif difficult to have a history of what is non not objects, no? And, uh, and there are all kinds of other things which are not objects, which are uh, quasi-objects, as Michel Serre calls it, and then non-objects. Uh, and to some extent, um, particularly exhibitions are not being collected. So uh, exhibitions from that point of view are extremely uh, fragile in their kind of memory. Um, and uh, I think very often uh, biennales are a great opportunity 
for experiments of exhibitions. And that's maybe the, one of the things, you know, if something has gone wrong um, with these many, many biennales which there exist, is that there are not enough experiments with exhibitions, that they just follow a kind of a routine, 50 artists, and that leads to that sort of phenomenon, which is very frustrating, that it's a kind of a, a, a routine phenomenon. And very often also there isn't the time. I mean, the problem biennales have, and that's uh, the biggest problem, I would say, worldwide, is that usually the curator is invited six or nine months before the opening, because once the Biennale is over, nothing happens for six months, and then, you know, the fundraising starts, and then one doesn't know whom to invite, and, you know, and then it's all done in an enormous rush. And as of recently, you know, it's very often gone down to six months, and that's, you know, a real problem. And from that point of view, we might want to think if maybe, you know, it's more interesting the time frame of a triennale or even a quadrennale, you know, where then the time is given uh, to make something really, really meaningful. And I think if a city produces something really sensational every four years, that is much more interesting than when a city produces something of a routine, ordinary, every two years, something like that. Hello. Um, I just wanted to ask you about your... Oh, OK. Um, my name is Jasper, Joseph Lester. I'm from London. Um, I just wanted to ask you about your, um, what you are, you, the way you could, uh, develop your, your practice through dialogue um, and the nature of that dialogue, because um, I'm, I'm curious about the, the kind of process, in a sense, that you've adopted, um, both of you, I suppose, in terms of um, sort of talking to uh, a wide range of kind of practitioners um, from, from different areas. Um, is, is there a point where dialogue no longer works and you have to resort back to the, the kind of individual, the individual and or concept of the curator? Um, or, or is this a process that you're committed to um, and that's, that's your kind of project, if you like? Do you want to start? Yeah, I'm... Well, I think dialogue is much more present in my life than curating is, because I have many open dialogues, uh, whether with Hans Ulrich, who is also a curator, or with an other fellow artists who are curators, but uh, who are artists, but maybe sometimes they are curating something. And, and then there are also... Uh, the majority of these dialogues, they do not, in my case, and then I, quickly I think it will be your uh, word, it's uh, the majority of the dialogues, they do not produce themselves into a collaborations. So it's a different kind, it's like a different bringing to, to, to fruits of these of this dialogues. Um, and there is always something from the, my experience as artist and also co-curator in the second uh, step of the Il Tempo del Postino, for example, what is interesting is that, yes, there's always a point where the dialogue has to stop. There's always a point where you can suggest to the other artist what you think. And there's always a point there are certain things that are not dialogable, like uh, you I don't know, there's something which is interesting, but this comes with the nature of the artist, that there is always something that when you enter and discuss the other person's aesthetics, then there is always a border. And this border, it's not a matter of courage to break it or not, it's simply, it's nice when you don't break it. And there are certain, and you, all, you, you needn't always get an answer for a question. Um, so there is a way how it starts as a dialogue, and then at some point there are some corners, and that's where it, it stops, the thing. Yeah, it's uh, obviously, I think, very different for a curator probably to answer the question and then for, you know, for an artist, but yet uh, I think it's extremely interesting to which extent it's maybe connected. But I think, uh, you know, for me it's just, and I can't really generalize, it's a, it's a, my answer is just to do with my you know, own biography. And I, I met very early, you know, when I was a kid, artists like Fischli Weiss and, you know, Alighiero Boetti, and that t changed completely around my world and how I see the world. And, you know, sort of made me into uh, someone who organized exhibition because I wanted to work with artists and I don't, didn't even know at the beginning uh, 
but that was a curator and I think you know to some extent it's still a very malleable notion in the sense of that it's a recent profession and it's actually something you know it's not like a job into which you go but it's something you you invent I mean I think in this sense it's it's uh, uh, it's, it's something one one can one can shape and you know and invent and one just calls it a curator I mean Jalal Tufic told me the other day that he thinks I should get rid of the notion altogether and just no longer call myself a curator because he thinks it's too you know it's too much a, you know maybe a, a wrong notion and all of that and that's maybe a bit what Cedric Price meant when he thought as an urbanist he should get rid of the notion of the city but I mean one of the things which it has to do with this, you know, to work with artists and find ways of working with artists. And I think the idea of it being a very close dialogue, for me, a trigger for everything was this conversation with uh, Francis Bacon and David Sylvester. Uh, and they're very much about limits of a dialogue, you know, the unspeakable things you can't. And it was so difficult for Bacon to talk about the work and it was so difficult for him to be interviewed and little by little, you know, uh, Sylvester found ways to talk to him and it took a long, long time, it took 20 years. And I think that's what makes that book so special and any kind of conversation I've ever had with an artist has more to do with that. So I don't think it's so much to do with communication, but it's maybe really more to do with a very sort of uh, long-term kind of, you know, dialogue, which very often also resists kind of fast communication or something like that. Uh, but it's kind of difficult really to, to talk about it because it's something, I mean, Tino Segal, again, uh, who has a, a, actually a theory about this, this thing, he wrote to me that he, he thinks that it's a lot to do with the, uh, the, the sort of trope of the encounter, of the conversation, uh, one could say of the intersubjective, so that maybe uh, the sort of static human to object relation, you know, gets transcended. In, in, in such a situation with a dynamism which is, which, is, which is intersubjective. And that's definitely something I've been interested uh, always. But I think to some extent what, what is so, so important is that the, the dialogue is, 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 is a dialogue which, is, which produces reality. And what the dialogue sort of produces as reality is very often unpredictable. So I don't know when I started in the early 90s to be friends with Gerhard Richter, you know, the first thing we did together was a small exhibition in the Nietzsche house in Sils Maria in the Swiss mountains. Uh, and then it led to a book of his collected writings. And so, you know, it was not something which one could have predicted. The dialogue led us there and very often it has to do with the fact what, you know, to be a utility. And I think uh, in this sense, it's actually, you know, it's not rocket science, but it's quite sort of pragmatic. I think, you know, one thing, one definition of the curator is to be a utility, you know, to be to be useful and to to, to you know to help things happen. Or as J. G. Ballard once told me, um, to be a junction maker. But I think there are so many different roles of the curator. It's a kind of a generalist sort of profession. Uh, Felix Fenéon said in the early 20th century, a curator is someone who throws many pedestrian bridges, and that's obviously also part of the role. It's also it's not only the dialogue with the artist, but once the exhibition then happens, it's also finding ways of actually, you know, transmitting that to the world and, and that's also part of it. And then fundraising is also part of it and, uh, you know, doing books is part of it. And so it's kind of don't stop from that point of view. Hi, um, Monika Szafczyk. I'm actually just going to follow up on your question because it's been in the back of my mind the entire time for a long time now actually but I'm wondering about events like this and um, your sort of beginning premise of constructing reality um, as as the the kind of most ambitious horizon for an exhibition or an artwork and to what extent um, you see a kind of conference in a way replacing the Biennale in this context, um, having, having the potential to, to construct reality and what differentiates this kind of thing from an exhibition or an artwork. And I'm also curious in, in what you've been saying about the experience of the artwork in a Biennale context and how it's somewhat impossible, but I'm wondering if the exhibition is actually experienced as a kind of operatic artwork in that context. And if that then pushes you to construct more operatic artworks as an artist, do you see what I mean? Mm -hmm. yeah. I think just quickly to 
take it from the ending we've been discussing more and more also together but also with other artists about this idea of making exhibitions which become like the artwork or the medium so it's not anymore so about the individual works um, but it's about how to blur and how to connect them even in, in a stronger way with each other and have something which would somehow destroy a little bit and go against the, the individual narratives of each work but bring forward whatever is about tempo in each work, you know, like things that you experience that are not going through the making sense by the language or by the content, by the narrative of it, but go through the score or through the way how, what time they take, what, I, what kind of tempo they bring to you. So in a way, um, there is one thing which cannot happen in a biennial. There is this, where the exhibition becomes a medium and the work in itself, which brings forward not the individual narratives or whatever brings together, links together on a narrative level the, the different works, but would bring forward this kind of tempo or a score or, or a, um, I mean, when I mean tempo, I mean it in a very large sense, like including it in whatever is time-based uh, artworks and everything. So would the, could the biennial do this? I don't know, but has the biennial done it? Not, not really, uh, so far. So from there I could, uh, but I'll say there is, is it possible to, to experience an art world really in a biennial? It could be. Is it possible to experience all of them one by one? I, don't, I doubt this. And is it possible that the, that the biennial itself becomes an experience on itself, such as it would become this idea of an exhibition as a medium, exhibition of, as a work of art on itself, which is not just about the individual works, but also the, 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 the space within and in between the, uh, the works. This, I think, it, it, it hasn't been able to do so far. But that leads a bit to the conversation we had maybe in the break, which was about that notion of scale, maybe also, no? The idea that, I mean, the Vietnamese General Jap, uh, who Mario Merz loved to quote, um, he said, when you win territory, you lose concentration, and when you win concentration, you lose territory. And, you know, to some extent, um, I always had the impression with Utopia Station, you know, we wouldn't have been able really to do that concentration on the scale of the whole Biennale. It was, we worked for 18 months, day and night, um, non-stop, you know, to fill this huge space at the end of the Arsenale and the garden. And, you know, that's just what it needed, you know. It didn't need 2,000 square meters, somehow. I mean, it so maybe has to do with scale, mm. no? And also, I mean, when we talked about Tempo del Postino, there also we worked for, there we worked for 10 years on it, you know, and it just was like, you know, a stage in a theater. And, it wasn't thousands of square meters. And then with the Tirana project, it's another old notion of occupying or non-occupying space. So maybe it's got to do with that. I'm not sure. Yeah, in that sense, there is a link because in the Tempo del Postino, since there was this distribution of time and everything was taking place one after the other in the same space. And in the sense of Tirana, it was the buildings are sometimes quite far apart from each other. So when you go from one building to the other, you are not in the biennial, you are in the city. So that's that's so it's a little bit uh, like the two radical sides of 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 uh, working or answering to the question of space in a biennial, like uh, a very small concentrated space or or much bigger space to the point that it's not a biennial, but it's a street and uh, yeah. Now when we did Dhaka, I mean again, you know, it wasn't. Uh like thousands of square meters, but Dhaka, what did Dhaka need? We felt Dhaka urgently needed an experimental cinema because it doesn't exist and there's such a necessity and the desire of, uh, you know, the, the, the local context to see films. And so we felt very important to just transform one space. So it was an empty palace of justice, which was kind of a, a ruin. We just recreate, transformed it to an exhibition display for it to become a cinema for the duration of uh, our big, actually multiple cinemas, I can say, where artists exhibited. So, so these are projects which in this sense, you know, each time have a sort of a different surface. So maybe we need expanding biennales and shrinking biennales, you know. Maybe the problem is also that once you define a biennale, it needs each time, you know, it needs to fill these huge spaces or, you know, it has. And so maybe 
Sometimes it needs 10 times more space, and sometimes it needs 10 times less space. And it doesn't mean that the shrinking Biennale would be less successful. I mean, for example, with Tempo de Postino, we, you know, we got a lot of people to Manchester for that. You know, at least as many people, as many big Biennales, the whole art world you know, came into Manchester, came to see that. So it's not necessarily only because something is smaller or maybe more compressed that it will get less attention or get less visitors or get less something like that. It's kind of a complicated issue. I think it has also to do with the, with the issue of expectations, because however each biennial can be different from another because of the city which happens and what was the, the reasons or the desires, the will or the, the... Behind it, it's still there is, we have expectations about biennial, but what kind of expectation do you have of a show which happens with time? You might have start with expectation once it happens a couple of times, or what, and and so on with the other, uh, with some other examples that it's some. It's also the changing of of it so that the expectations don't exist yet. I'm curious how this kind of works with the expectation you mentioned in Tino Segal's work of of this kind of immediate experience, um, and I think this really arises very much from the inability to take in something like a Biennale. I think that expectation becomes more and more urgent. The more we have occasions to not see things fully. You know, you see what I mean? Like the more Biennales there are, the more we go to them, but we also don't experience them fully. And that unfull <laughs> experience probably produces this kind of higher desire for for something immediate. And I'm I'm really kind of curious about how you treat the rise in this kind of situation where you're asked to speak on stage um, as maybe the kind of promise of a very immediate interaction with the people who come to Biennales, this sort of thing. And it's, for me, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm posing a question, but what I'm observing, I guess, is this kind of, um, in relation to what you spoke about, the production of reality, is a kind of, uh, alternate notion of parliament, where I think in art there's a huge horizon of, of kind of, you know, producing reality, producing a politics, or producing something that has an effect on the real world, and we're all here together. It's about the size of a parliament of a small country. I mean, there's not that many people in a parliament, you know, in representative politics. We could actually start to think about what that could mean in Bergen, which is a city, or, you know, you spoke about this kind of very close relationship to the mayor and to what extent that, you know, in, in a Biennale, that kind of mayoral relationship is, is kind of on, on the urban level is, is already producing a politics. I'm sorry, I don't really have a question, but I've just been very interested in I what was, you're saying. <laughs> I, I was speaking like uh, uh, a week ago with a, with a friend who's an artist, and we're talking about elections and elections coming in Germany and there were elections in Albania, the rigged elections in Albania. And we were talking about all this, like, shouldn't it be like a, a software, a computer who makes the counting and who makes after the, not only the counting, but who makes the whole, um, what has to be done over four years. And after four years, we elect to gain a software, but at least there is a kind of principle once you have accepted. So after the elections should be, between, I don't know, Windows Vista and, you know, but like this idea of what are parts of the, of the, of the life where we, we, we agree or disagree that could be turned over into something much more neutral to, 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 to run them. And, uh, and, I, and again, it was a matter of size because we both agreed that, for example, when it comes to very local politics, then it's good again to have a, a person. But when it, when it comes to very large, uh, surfaces of like large countries that cover lar very big policies, then maybe this idea of software and of a computer running the thing rather than a politician, since you're talking about it, could be maybe more interesting. Um, and after we, ob obviously we went to the dangerous path of like, should we apply the same idea to the art and to the curating and to the things, uh, and then we stopped it there. <laughs> <laughs> But your question also, I mean, uh, hints maybe at something which would lead us to this sort of whole idea of the format. I mean, Andrew and I talked a lot today about formats of exhibitions, you know, and maybe questioning existing formats or inventing of new formats, shifting rules of the game. And it's obviously interesting, you know, that th where that is very little applied is 
the idea of the speaker on the stage. Well, you know, all over the world, thousands of panels happen every day, and there is always a table and, and all of that. It's kind of interesting, you know, um, and the Q and A and all of that. But I think, you know, to play with these formats in terms of uh, of conferences is something I'm immensely, you know, interested. And it really all started uh, with um, a theatre festival in Germany, you know, years ago, inviting me to do, you know, a conversation project on stage, and we didn't really know what to do. And I then thought, you know, maybe. One could try to do a marathon and could sort of try to do a 24 hour, you know, non stop interview, which we did in Stuttgart. And that was somehow the beginning of our, you know, serpentine marathons, which now happen annually, where there is basically, you know, and there it's not really completely clear anymore, maybe, if these are conferences or if there are exhibitions. Because, for example, if we did last year the Manifesto Marathon, where artists would present, you know, would present manifestos, um, performances, uh, that very much, uh, you know, is somewhere between a conference, a happening. Uh, it's a kind of a new format, maybe, which we don't really know exactly how to define it. Uh, and to some extent, definitely has to do with the fact of maybe bringing what we know from the world of exhibitions. We're kind of experts from the world of exhibition, of permanently questioning format, bringing that into the world of, you know, conference and, and lecture and, and all of that. And then I think, I mean, the other thing, which is obviously, I think, very interesting and, and also relevant, I think, is this idea of having a conversation in, in, in early stages you know, of a project and not only once the project is up you know, and running. And I think that that's what is so interesting about this idea uh, in Bergen when uh, I hear for the first time about this event happening here, is that it's not a conference stage, because whenever there is a Biennale, there is also a conference right, to accompany the Biennale. But it's highly unusual that before it's completely decided what happens, just ideas are discussed. And, and I think that that's a very you know, unique new idea, which uh, in the context of all these hundreds of biennales has never happened. And so we, we, we think it's a, it's a great initiative. Um. I just, I just wondered, um, I'm English, but I live in Norway, I'm an artist. Um, I just wondered your impressions, you both have traveled a great deal and have a lot of experience from different biennales. When you came to Bergen yesterday or this morning or whenever, um, and you flew in over the mountains and saw this little town down there, or, um, it's quite a, um, a sort of unusual setting it's a very unusual situation. I was wondering what kind of immediate thoughts you had. You knew you were coming to a Biennale discussion. Um, because I, I've been thinking, I, I do part-time teaching at an architect school in Bergen, which is very international. There are students from all over the world there. And one of our South American students is doing um, an investigation into kind of, in a way, being very critical to um, exhibiting and the sort of exhibiting that has taken place up to now in many, many countries. But he was analysing um, how can a biennale or something that happened, I like very much, by the way, what you said about something very good happening every four years, yeah? You know, something which had really been thought about and profoundly kind of worked on, yeah? Not something that just kind of has been thought up very quickly for the last six months. But I'm thinking a little bit about the infiltration into the society, the context. Have you experienced any places where that's really kind of having an impact on the people who live in the place? Because Biennales, who are they for? You know, we love going to, most of us probably love going to Venice. We love the experience of, you know, wandering around, going to Arsenale and, yeah, experiencing the existing place as well the old Venice, you know, that kind of, I was thinking a little bit about what about something that perforates a city. I liked what you said, I just want to try and, I like very much what you said about the multi-layering, yes? How things can be experienced on several levels, you know, but mm. I'm very interested in the, the intervention, you know, how it affects the place as a kind of liminal experience, which it would be, even though you spent four years working on it. <laughs> That's all, I just, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Do you want to start? Um, no, I mean, it's, in, 
this is interesting when you, when you think of how many of the local people would go to see the biennial and how many of the people who are traveling to usually to see the biennial or the biennials and um, I mean I it's not like I have such a huge experience with them because when I participated in quite of the few but uh, biennials in the very first years it was a work that was there in the biennial so I, I didn't have such a I had a very subjective approach to it like going to biennial try taking care that the work is installed, you know, it's like that's, it's only later that some more experience gathers. So it's, uh, I think Asuri could be much more uh, well placed to, to, to answer of, from, from a better perspective. But from my experience with the, with the Tirana Biennial, for example, is for, for once it's one biennial that has been visited between like 20 and 30,000 people, which is a lot for, a city, for the, the city. And I don't think it has been ever more than say 200, um, maybe 50 foreigners to come besides the first time because it was done together with flash art so it brought more of this the international aura but otherwise there are not more than 50 people who would come besides the invited foreign artists who would come there so in that sense the, the impact is a lot and has a lot to do about the the the, the real audience of that biennial now, this thing depends on so many things because I wouldn't say this is, this is black and white because Berlin, for example, is another very interesting city where, which is yet very different from Venice because not only it's a mix between real locals who are there, but also in the real locals, there are many foreigner locals. locals. So, in a way, it's like, for example, when it's a biennial in Berlin, I don't feel like the artist was going to the biennial, but I'm also walking from where I live and I go to see the biennial. So, there, it really depends on what is the, the ratio, in, in the, in the, depending on the context of the city or the country, between who are the visitors, who are the locals, how many there are foreign, like have this kind of strangeness or foreignness in, uh, in the locals and how many don't have it. And this is also another thing that creates so many parallels, so you cannot judge one format to the other. Like this a priori I would say it's very good when a biennial has an impact in the local public. No? Like, uh, but then I think one has to take it one by one uh, and see the, where are the balances between the, these different uh, uh, forms of public. Yeah, I fully agree, and I think, I mean, to some extent, you know, I grew up in Switzerland, and uh, at the time, you know, before the biennial age had started, and the thing we haven't mentioned yet, which I wanted to go into a little bit, is this idea that... Switzerland has no biennial. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and it's actually very interesting why, <laughs> indeed, Switzerland has no biennial, and also, you know, most Swiss curators are in exile. But <laughs> the thing which is, uh, as, you know, Harald Seemann always called it, uh, you know, uh, Geistige Gastarbeit or whatever he called it. But the thing is, you know, in some kind of way, um, before the, the, the Biennale age broke out in the 90s, it was the age of the Großausstellung. Uh, and that was really, the, you know, the large scale exhibition. So these were large, very often thematic or geographical shows. I mean, I mentioned Westkunst before. You could also, we could mention von Hieraus, another great, you know, Kaspar König. Uh, Exhibition, we could mention Hang zum Gesamtkunstwerk, the tendency towards the total work of art by Harald Seemann. You know, these were shows which were not smaller than Biennales. They were big roundabout shows, um, but that they were not declared Biennales. They were just, you know, a city wanted to make a, a statement and got a curator to do a big show, and, you know, they found a topic or found an angle. And that was the moment of the Großausstellung, you know, with people like König or, or, or Seemann. And obviously, Seemann was somehow the first contact I had with such Großausstellung, uh, pre-Biennale. Um, and, you know, it turned my whole world around when, as, when I was 14, 15, 16, I would go to the Kunsthaus Zurich and uh, see these shows. So it changed my life as a kid. And obviously I didn't have a possibility to travel, so, you know, wouldn't these shows have happened in Switzerland? I might not ever have, you know, entered the contemporary art context and you know all of that so it was really very very important it was like my school no so i think we should not underestimate that such mm. biennales do have a very local necessity because for thousands and thousands are you know very often they're actually visited by tens or hundreds of thousands of people locally you know they are a school they are a school of seeing they are a school of being and you know we can say there are 100 biennales but what does it matter in tirana you know 
that there are 100 other Biennales. If there isn't a Biennale in Tirana, there is no Biennale in Tirana. And for all the kids, there are no opportunity to see that work. No? And so from that point of view, uh, there is a clear necessity for such important rendezvous. Now, we can ask ourselves if maybe at the moment when Biennales are all over the place, we might reactivate the Großausstellungsmodell, because maybe that's another option of what cities could do. You know, cities could just every now and then do a great big exhibition and not even declare it a Biennale. You know, and that mm -hmm. might also yeah. work uh, uh, somehow. Yeah, in a way, the question could be to, let's say for a moment that there are 1,000 Biennials going on in 1,000 different cities, but we simply don't know of them. Is it a good or is it a bad thing? So in a way, the moment that we don't know them, but the fact that they are, it's, I think it's only, it can only be a good thing. Exactly. So the, 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 the problem starts in the moment that there are people, there, is a class, there are people who are aware of all and, and part of them who, are, who manage to go and see. So it depends where the complaining starts, in that sense. And also the potential of the bridge, you know, because I think to some extent, because your question included several questions, I think, I mean, you know, one of the things um, I also thought is, is maybe t to be mentioned, is this idea that the Biennale, I mean, I've, I've done this A to Z over the last couple of years, uh, where, which I have recently transformed into a Biennale manifesto. And uh, one of the points in my Biennale A to Z, it goes from A for archipelago, C for critical mass, D for death of the Biennale, E for Etonne moi, F for the future of the Biennale, P for pluralism of the Biennale, I for in between Biennale, M for memory Biennale, N for new, ge new geographies, the whole Fernand Baudel chapter Biennale, O for organic Biennale, O for ongoing Biennale, P for production of reality Biennale, T for transnational Biennale, etc. etc. So within this, you know, A to Z, which I don't have the time here to go into detail, but I'm preparing to publish this quite soon. In this, in this A to Z, there is B for bridge. And I think in answer to your question, I think this sort of whole idea of building bridges between the local and the global is a great potential such large-scale exhibitions have. And, and you know, they, they have because of their critical mass and they bring in people from abroad, visitors from abroad, who, who enter a contact zone with a local art scene. And very often when I visit the Biennale, you know, it allows me to become familiar with the Istanbul art scene. It allows me to become familiar with, you know, the Tirana art scene because me to familiar with art scenes I just don't know. And that's the case, I think, for many of the international visitors. At the same time, it puts the local context into a context with the international. And that's something which uh, somehow Huang Yongping, the, the Chinese artist, uh, uh, always told me that he thinks that actually a person usually has only one standpoint, but when you become a bridge, you have to have two standpoints. And that's uh, maybe also a kind of explanation for the concept of crossing the border of the self. So as one person, you should or could have many standpoints. And between these two points, there is one that is maybe more stable, uh, and then there is another point which is maybe less stable, which is floating. And the bridge is always dangerous. And as Huang Yongping says, it's actually the nature of the danger of this bridge, which is so positive, because it creates the possibility to open up for something else. And by resorting to the notion of chance, one can have access to enlightenment. That's all Huang Yongping in terms of philosophy. Traditional Chinese philosophers uh, uh, never said I say, but they always said, our ancestors said. And so that's a kind of a way of accessing reality. So that sort of whole idea, you know, I think of a bridge of Biennale is very often being both local and global um, is, a, is, a, is a great potential not to be, not to be missed. I have a, uh, I think, rather boring question about the political pragmatics of working with new formats, which I really appreciate. I think it's the most productive idea to say that biennales or whatever we want to call it is a way of rethinking continually exhibition and, I think, conference formats. I'll just speak from my own experience, uh, my experience of a radically different conference format that was um, an experiment in uh, uh, San Sebastian, in advance of the uh, Manifesta exhibition in San Sebastian, San Sebastian, a way of priming the city of San Sebastian towards new types of artistic and intellectual production. So we were, I think, uh, somewhere between 20 and 40 so-called 
important producers or whatever you would call it in the field of art criticism and curatorial practice assembled in Sebastian for 10 days in a very luxurious hotel uh, for a kind of a summit. We were not giving talks. We had all in advance sent out our texts, highly diverse texts on whatever topic we would choose. The whole thing was called the time of exchange, a very evocative title and everything was multi-translated into all the languages that we were speaking and were seated around summit tables like at a kind of political summit and uh, it was a shattering experience fabulous socially uh, shattering intellectually because there was no decided on any kind of common ground so it was really like completely open situation and therefore open to all kinds of conflicts, manipulations. Uh, yeah, it, it was a fabulous thing and a catastrophe. And this, of course, like any event like this, highly sponsored, politically uh, enclosed uh, in every way, uh, is met with a question, what comes out of this? Is it productive? And of course, from the point of view of the organizers after a little while and the politicians there was complete panic this is not <laughs> productive so what was supposed to have happened a mediation of this big conference this very expensive conference was stopped so the result of these 10 days of strange collaboration has never been mediated the way it should have been. It was closed down. So this is one example of, uh, I think, what is a very interesting experimental idea, meeting uh, political reality. Another, I think, far more banal example is my own experience with uh, curating, co-curating a small biennial here and saying we want to work with 20 artists and we work, want to work with a different type of temporal structure because we think that's the best way to to work within the budget and to 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 do something that's responsible and that creates a specific experience and uh, we were just told no this is not a biennale you have to have 40 artists this has to have the, the building has to be like this and like that and uh, so that was another uh, pragmatic situation so i was thinking with your big experience trying to break into new formats and meeting with politicians and fund, fund, fundraisers and uh, so on all over the place. I'm, I'm, I would really like to hear what has been your, uh, what has been your yeah, experience so far. Um, yeah, I think, I'm thinking somehow, um, my approach in relation to this very interesting point has actually been probably very much determined by my by my museum work. And I think when you work within a museum, you know, you you do projects which uh, are you know very public, and then you do projects which maybe are laboratory conditions, and you cannot do either or because if you only do blockbuster shows, you know, what's the sense? And if you only do experiment, you know, the, sooner or later a problem because there are no more visitors, so you always need to find the mix. And I think with Biennales very often it's a bit the same thing. You, know, you need one ingredient which maybe immediately works, and then one ingredient which another time window which goes up or pops up later somehow. And I mean, it took me a long time to figure it out, but for example, you know, in the early 90s I, I did things like um, Art and Brain, which was a conference uh, similar to the one you describe. It was a big fiasco. We brought artists and neuroscientists together and there was a, you know, not an immediate outcome. And it was only 10 years later that you know, TV crews from all over Germany went to that science center to find out what happened during this week because they hear you know, that books and exhibitions and all kinds of things have come out because of that. But it took a long time and that's too long because people are not that patient. No, they don't give you 10 years. And I'm sure that you know, one day what you've described in terms of this legendary San Sebastian conference will be published and discovered and is very, very important. It just 
takes a longer time. Same thing was true for our project Laboratorium, which we did in Antwerp, and where Caroline was one of the protagonists, you know, which was a hardcore experiment on a very large-scale level of a city, uh, you know, and um, uh, a large-scale exhibition, which, you know, only had, I think, 2,000 visitors, and then obviously, you know, there was a certain nervousness, you know, because it maybe wasn't public enough, but in the meanwhile, it's become legendary. And I think one of the things maybe since then I try to incorporate is to combine the two, to, you know, to do windows which open immediately and then windows which take longer to open and combine them. And I think very often it's also, you know, uh, something which maybe immediately gains the visibility, allows the other project to happen. So it's somehow, you know, combining things, combining different temporalities and if it's private or public support, you know, uh, both sides at a certain moment, obviously, as you say, want results. And so I think from that point of view, you know, it's gestaffelt. I don't know how you would call that in English. It's kind of like in, in different, you know, I don't know the word, kind of, you know, in different uh, steps. Many steps. I think Douglas Gordon once says seven steps to heaven or something like this. So it's step, you know, shorter steps and longer steps, something like that. But anyway, there are no recipes for that. I think it's the biggest challenge, no? Somehow, the biggest difficulty always there. And very often projects which uh, are also, I mean, if we look at Tempo del Postino, you know, it had an appearance in Manchester and then two years later an appearance in Basel. They were very different, no? And yeah. There was yeah. time between. What do you think? About the Tempo del Postino? That, that uh, question. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I don't have the same. Um, I have the same experience because I don't have to deal with the same programs, and uh, I have so much more the choice to not have to be active all the time and have to be in a dialogue with 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 politics or with the, the people. Um, and and actually, my my closest reference to politics is a little bit. Uh, it doesn't help me because it's it's somebody who is really very organic in the way how he's been doing politics, which is the mayor in Tirana. So it's not a very. It doesn't set a, a, a good example about how boring, but still, you have to fight for it until until some kind of less boring result comes out of it. So I I think I'd be a very bad uh, advisor in that sense. But I kind of learned, I mean, for me, the, 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 the teacher for that was really, you know, I had several mentors, and one of my mentors was, was, uh, was Suzanne Paget, the former director of the Musée d'Art Moderne de la Ville de Paris. And she orchestrated, you know, and that's actually where, how Henri and I met for the first time, because we invited Henri to be part in an exhibition there called Voila, Le Monde dans la Tête, which was a big encyclopedic exhibition we curated with Boltanski and Lavier. Where also you the idea of the millennium, no? Like this idea of the... Somehow, no? Yeah. It's related to the question of today because it was a large-scale show. Mm. And then, in the same context of the museum, we did in the Couvent du Cordelier, uh, Henri's solo show. Uh, and, and, and somehow, you know, Suzanne Paget, the director of the museum with whom I worked and from, her, from whom I learned everything about how a museum worked, you know, she'd always have a kind of a blockbuster historic exhibition um, and that exhibition would be done in closed dialogue with artists. So she would do a Picabia show, but she'd do it with Fishley Weiss. So it would be super interesting for the art community, but it would also be super interesting for the larger public who does know about contemporary art, right? So it worked it was like a double coded thing, no? It's sort of most advanced yet acceptable, can one say that? Yeah, it was most advanced yet acceptable. Then at the same time, there would be a show of Henri, a solo show of Henri, um, and at the same time, there would be a migrateur project of a very unknown young artist who just has his first museum show, and it's a sort of the puzzle of these things, you know, which somehow. And uh, I think in a similar way, you know, with large-scale exhibitions, it's, 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 it's the same. There are certain aspects of them which are maybe very accessible, and there are other aspects of them which have more to do with the laboratory, something like that. But Mala was actually a great Yeah, very big, yeah. Yeah, so, um, I'm Sulvai, it's me. Um, so we're talking about formats and we're talking about artworks and of course those two influence each other and when we're now discussing a biennial in Bergen of course we are 
the first thing we actually have to talk about is what kind of format do we want to have if we're going to make a biennial? How would it, will it be? How often will it be? And, and so on. Um, but I'm going to just go a little bit back to this space and time issue and this notion that you said about the left open biennial as the biennial that kind of gives something back or it sticks after it's finished in contrary to the biennial that is done when it's done. Of course that has a lot to do with the organization of a biennial that it's kind of over when it's over as well in a way, more than in contrary to a museum which is of course lasting. Mm -hmm. um, and you example this with the Tirana Biennial and the Utopian Station. Is there something in this, in this type of art that were at show in these biennials or, or large-scale exhibition that differs from the, from the art that were in traditional biennials that doesn't travel or stick afterwards? That was one question. And the other question is if you, Henri, could tell me if when you get invited to biennials or when you get invited to museum shows, if you think differently on how you would like to present your work or what kind of work you present. Of course, that is also a curatorial question and you're asked to maybe be part of a group show, but still, do you have your own thoughts about it? Mm -hmm. I think to start on the second question, it's very different from the start when you're invited to a museum show because it means it's a solo show. You, you like I was talking a little bit before, like you have a way to, to, to bring out from your works things that are coming less out when they are part of group shows and to neutralize a little bit things which have been over exposed in those group shows. But it comes also because it comes with this idea of togetherness of works. So at the end it's not about having an icon work, you know, like one, which is very different with the, with the, with the biennial in that um, sense. So it's very different from the very start. And very often it happens, it happens in, the, in, the, in the biennials that people also especially ask you for a given work on that. That's why in my experience, and um, by this I'm not wanting to say now that there is all the other biennials were the same and one stand out, but in my experience Utopia Station was different because it made me think of something which became a work later. So that's why it was interesting to me. But there is nothing, as I've been also perfectly fine with when there is another biennial and where in the context of the local context plus the, the, the context of the, of, the, of the theme of the biennial, they choose another work which has been produced before, um, that's also fine in that sense. While, and in the examples that we gave uh, in each of them, in my work for example in the Utopia Station wasn't of a different format when you see it, because it's a video that could very well jump to another biennial if, if it would have been asked and if it fits to the, to the context of that biennial. So it's not the work such as such, but the history of how the work was the, the, the terminus of a, of, a, of a process of thinking that I started at the same time as Utopia Station started, and at the same time it was at the terminus because it was the basis of what made us think later about this Tirana biennial and how to work more with the facade. So it linked it like for one thing it was the end and for something else it was the continuation in that way. While in the sense of, uh, of Il Tempo del Postino that we are not mentioning because yes it's not a biennial but it's interesting as a format, it was produced for that because it's not every day that artists are given time instead of uh, space and for many of the artists that we were there most of us do not work with the live element of the live performance where you negotiate everything in a live um, um, dimension. So, but then it's again, it's like it makes you vulnerable, but also it's very challenging and at the same time it helps you maybe knock out into, into another thing that maybe it becomes very central to your work after that. Uh, and again, the, the, the buildings in Tirana, it was something out of the format, like it was part of the format of the biennial, and then, it, like you say, it sticks to, to, to the city and it's still there. So, it, I, I'm not bringing a, uh, an answer to the question, do you make a different work for biennials? Because I, would, I think it would be very, my answer would be ugly if I said that, yes, artists do different works thinking of the biennial, but do the biennials urge you to make a new work, and having said that, does, there is nothing wrong with biennials that don't urge you to make a new work and don't put that pressure, but they, 
it's, the utopia station for me, it wasn't the pressure. It was, uh, it was uh, the only thing that was pressuring that it was deadline, but there's this kind of deadlines that you, you wish you had so that you could make work in that sense. And also, I mean, one of the things I think all, all these projects, as you know, different they are, but all the projects we mentioned have in common, uh, is this idea of you know, aiming at sustainability and legacy of some sort. No? And I think uh, that definitely, I mean, it might be a bit a simplest you know, analysis, because I'm sure in reality it's always more complicated. Uh, but I think it's got to do one way or the other with this idea of um, more, more limited resources and this idea of um, an exhibition you know, being temporary and then everything thrown away and you know, the exhibition design thrown out and the next show comes. It's just something which feels very much not of our moment, no? of, of more and more limited resources and, 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 and the concern to, to be responsible with resources. And that's something which really, for me, started when we did Cities on the Move you know, in the 90s, when we started to no longer throw away exhibition designs, but we started to build exhibition designs on other you know, exhibition designs. And um, all of these exhibitions, one way or the other, you know, continue in time. I mean, Tempo de Postino, we didn't throw it away or just return it, but it was all actually like um, uh, pr preserved in a way that it could be restaged. So if it two years later goes to Basel, it's just, you know, there. And that's something which in opera is very frequent. You just put an opera production in the box and then two or five years later, you can, you know, you can do it, you can do it again. But, but on the other side, still there were differences and changes, which yeah. was the same thing like with Utopia Station too, when it, it went to it Munich. Evolved, so it evolved, hopefully, no? At, uh... But then you've got many other possibilities we haven't addressed, you know? I mean, for example, I've mentioned the Venice Biennale never having collected. I mean, Venice could have the best contemporary art museum in the world in the world if they had collected. You know, Rauschenberg won the prize, they could have had the masterpiece of Rauschenberg for almost no money. You know, they were always there early, and, but they didn't collect, so you have no trace today in Venice. So that's definitely also one of the things, you know, which is, I think, intelligent biennales are somehow tying in with the collection. You know, it's something Thierry Raspail did in, in Lyon, you know, very intelligently, because very often the Lyon Biennale, which has not been going on for a long time, you know, the museum actually does acquire central pieces out of the Biennale and that, you know, creates also some form of long-term sustainability and, and traces, no, of, of a Biennale. So, so there are many, many ways, you know, how you can define and that just enters all the dimensions, I think, of, uh, of, the, of the work and, I mean, even like, for example, when, you know, Julia Peyton Jones and I invite an architect to do the Serpentine Annual Commission here, it's not that these pavilions afterwards are kind of, you know, thrown away, no, they happen again in another city and develop another reality there, no, and so I think in some kind of way it's got to do with this idea of travelling without it being packaging and I think there's a huge potential how Biennales, you know, can travel, uh, but evolve whilst they travel and, and become a longer story, you know, through that. And that's certainly the biggest, one of the biggest unrealized dimension of the Biennales is that they, you know, is that they travel. I mean, for example, with Utopia Station from the Venice Biennale, it did go to Munich, so that was one of the few moments, it, you know, it worked. But otherwise, you know, most of the Biennales really end after the Biennale. And um, I think it will be very interesting also maybe how collaborations can happen you know, between Biennales and how maybe, you know, things could travel that way because very often, uh, I mean, there are, there's a huge potential for alliances. You've got a hundred Biennales out there and, you know, there could be many, many more synergies and alliances and things together uh, if it would not just be, you know, every Biennale um, trying to be on their own. And uh, so I think, you know, the potential for, for, for dialogues and, I mean, new alliances, maybe that's the kind of thing is also quite immense for the next years to come. More questions? Mm -hmm. Hi, my name is Melina. Um, I just had a comment and a question. I really agree with what you said, Henri, about um, a biennial potentially being, in the best case scenario, really a great opportunity for an artist to produce new work. Um, and in, in such a sense where you're challenged either to produce something that's outside your own, you know, the media you mostly work in or just that you're doing, you know, you're pushed through a dialogue to do your best work within a medium you've perhaps worked in. And I think 
for the um, first uh, performer in New York that's, you know, the, for those that are not familiar, the now um, it's going into a third edition um, performance biannual is a great example of that, where Rosalie um, Goldberg, the director, has commissioned several artists to do, that are not performance artists, mm -hmm. to do performances and very successfully so. I think some of the artists that participated in the editions I've seen the last two um, have done some of their strongest work. So I agree with that. But that said, I mean, observing different biennials around the world, I very often noted that artists, and you know, I'm, it's not fully clear always why that is, are not producing their strongest work. Artists that I usually like look as if they've been swayed by perhaps a larger budget that has been within their reach before. And they create works that seem, you know, just a little too big and a little, and, and I think in part that has to do with an era we're now perhaps leaving behind, you know, a very overheated market. So we had a very sort of big and very spectacular works from artists that are usually producing very particular and, and wonderful things. And I don't think names are necessary um, because hopefully other people have had this experience. So a question to you is, how do you avoid that in a sense, or what, what, what's your take on, do you agree, or what's your take on how to avoid that? And then also, um, I th it's, it's my impression that a lot of the really solid works that you know, came out of, for example, your collaboration, this exhibition, has to do also with the sustained dialogue between curator and artist. How do you negotiate that, keeping that sustained dialogue going with artists and continuously collaborating with artists and showing the same artists in exhibitions, a lot of the same names came up. And um, I've seen a lot of the artists you've mentioned, Rear Crit, uh, Liam, et cetera, in this, you know, um, the same context. How do you kind of negotiate doing that, um, which I think is, you know, a very good thing when curators and artists work together for a long period of time. But then also, how would I put it, um, satiate the appetite that biennials have for the new and the commitment in a sense of the responsibility of curators to show not just the usual suspects, but you know, both regional artists and artists that have possibly been undershown internationally. Mm -hmm. I, I, well, there's one part which, which you said that whether it's because of suddenly artists are able to produce in a large, I don't think it's been my experience. And besides, I think only once in the Yokohama Triennial, I've never, like, I never did work which was produced by the Biennial. It was only always myself producing the, the work. It was also the case with Dami Colori, for example. So uh, I wasn't aware, but I know that there are many, unless you do a site specific work, but I know that there are many Biennials who simply do not produce or don't give you such a, such a possibility. And anyway, it has mostly not been the case uh, with me. Um, about, uh, I'm, I'm a little bit in a, in a easier thing being an artist, and there is not, not such a uh, thing, nothing bad about what you could say as the usual suspects. It doesn't ring badly because it would be like the open dialogues. So there is like, for me, it's open dialogues. It's not the usual suspects. Um, and it's, that's what the question was that we were uh, talking before in that, on that issue. Uh, now I think, in the, and in the last point, there is something which I'm not sure whether I would agree. Uh, I mean, I think it's very good that people make research. That, I mean, it's, very, it's great when there are biennials that people say, wow, there were 70% or 80% of the work that I've never seen. But this should not be at the expense of the local audience that is not given some very good works of that of that year or two, simply because there was a, a pressure on the, or, or a desire, a free desire, free will of the curator to want to bring something new, but to whom? So that's also a tricky question because it's your very right to, to want to criticize this, but on the other side, it would be at the expense of the people who, are not, who cannot travel or who don't have the means to travel. But yeah, that's uh... yeah. But it raises a lot of issues also about the past, the, you know, the present and the future. Um, and I think you know, to some extent, uh, I think it was Panofsky who said that if we want to invent the future, we very often 
invent the future out of fragments or elements you know, from the past. And I think to some extent we cannot assume that given the fact uh, of us living in a digital age with uh, ever increasing, exponentially increasing amount of information, that that indeed does produce more memory. On the contrary, mm -hmm. you know, as Rem Kolas once said, uh, amnesia might very well be at the very core of our digital age. So to some extent, one of the key things is also that uh, a transgenerational dialogue you know, happens, which I think I've always tried and I think uh, is, is a very, you know, to, to, to bring into these exhibitions and this for me is very, you know, is very key to have a very young artist who just left art school, but then to have Gustav Metzger, no? and uh, to sort of have that sort of, you know, transgenerational dialogue on, I think is key. And then the thing about the usual suspects, I think, you know, um, in terms of curating, um, loyalty is very important. It's very important also that there is a sort of a long, ongoing conversation because, you know, first of all, never change a winning team, and particularly when, you know, you start to work longer together, you know, more and more the collaboration becomes amazing. But that obviously can lead easily to a danger which, you know, uh, could be called family curating, so that, you know, whenever a curator pops up, you know, pops up with the same, you know, seven artists. So I think it's important that, you know, curiosity, um, you know, obviously always leads also to an opening. So I think it's got to do with this idea of transgenerational dialogue. It's got to do with this idea of having very, you know, intense dialogue with artists of unknown generation, so one speaks every day, but then also dialogues to the past and dialogues, you know, into the future. Uh, and I think every kind of large-scale exhibition gives a lot of opportunity to do so. I mean, every large-scale exhibition gives a great opportunity to actually put artists uh, from you know totally different generations and that's something which again you know has to be on the positive side of the biennales you know a lot of biennales have actually helped the, the rediscovery and that's something which is a mechanism which in the art world um, is actually working very very well because very often artists talk about artists from the past which are important for them artists tell curators about artists from the past whom they should look at it happens very often to me that artists tell me you know, there is this or this artist from the 60s or 70s or, you know, whom... And for me, the whole idea of, of memory is anyway, you know, key. I think we need, as Eric Hobsbawm says, you know, we need a, a protest against uh, uh, forgetting. And I have a whole part of my, you know, interview project has all to do with, with, with that. And there's even a whole chapter in it, which is, you know, practitioners in their 90s, uh, uh, people whose, you know, I have seen eyes have seen a whole century uh, and telling me basically the sort of uh, whole century of their practice. And I think, you know, to some extent that protest against forgetting is an important part. So it's not only about young artists Biennale, that would be, you know, very, would be very, very um, limiting, something like that. So we have one question left and I ask for that question to both be short in question and answer because the sun has gone down and that means that we've been here for two and a half hours. Hi, I'm, I'm Laura Stewart, I'm from Site Santa Fe, and I had a, a question that, I, that maybe will be helpful for Bergen, because Site Santa Fe does a biennial and was founded to, be, uh, to look hard at place and to be site specific, that's why it's called that. But at a certain point, getting back to this local question, the cities are similar in size, Santa Fe and Bergen, Santa Fe is a little smaller. I really worry about exhausting our local seen. I mean, how many, the site-specific works that we're, that are part of our mission, and at, at a certain point, the, the Navajos don't want to talk to us anymore. They're like, and you again with your German artists, leave me alone. So I just, if you could, I mean, how, the, the idea of site specificity and, and of digging into your local scene is super key, but at a certain point, is it possible to exhaust? I mean, and then, and then what? You know, do you have to change your mission altogether, or, or could you speak to that a little bit? Site specificity. <laughs> no, it's interesting. I, I'm kind of uh, slow in the site answer. Site specific biennial. <laughs> S. Yeah, it needs. It's missing in my list. The site specific biennial. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> but do you mean site specific, like? Uh, because I think uh, the German artist could be very site-specific doing an intervention in Santa Fe, in that sense. Like, w what do you mean? Well, 
a show, I think, called Looking for a Place when he was the curator there that was looking, I mean, it's a, Santa Fe has this very special history and, and so on, and in general, artists who are part of that show tend to want to, they get excited about that history and want to make work about that history, and at, at a certain point, you, you can exhaust your, your local, you can wear out your welcome in a way. So I just, I wondered if, if this is a problem that's experienced in other biennials that, that are in, I mean, every city has its own history. Um, Santa Fe has a rather strange one, um, and that's why the biennial is there. But getting back to this artist's question about the, how, how you address your local audience and bring them in, but at a certain point, are there, is there a work about the fish market every biennial or, you know what I mean? <laughs> no, I think it's actually a really great point to end, you know, the, the discussion because in some kind of way, uh, it could be a topic for, you know, a conference itself. It's just, I think it's difficult to give a short answer. That's the trouble. The thing is, <laughs> the thing is that to, to some extent, um, Kaspar Koenig, you know, invented Münster, and uh, Münster happens every 10 years. I think it's fabulous that it happens every 10 years, and I think that's the right time frame for site specificity. I think, you know, site specificity is, is extremely, you know, slow, and I think it, it takes a lot of time. I think there's nothing more problematic than, you know, fast reactions to context without understanding them. And, and, uh, uh, and yeah, that would really be my answer. I think to some extent, you know, there could be obviously very site-specific components to such biennales, but I would think it would be very difficult to do that every second year, uh, you know, for, for just reasons of time. Um, I also think that one cannot reinforce it. I think it can be very uh, difficult if, if that's something which is, 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 is basically imposed to the artist or if the artists are pushed to do that. I think it's got to come from the artist because if an artist is really obsessed by the fish market, it will be very interesting, you know, that there is <laughs> a work on that fish market. But if an artist is kind of pushed to do something on, you know, that kind of fish market because it needs to have a local component, that can also be very difficult. So I think in some kind of way, it almost in a self-organized way has, you know, has to fall in place. And I think that that works very, very well with Münster, where there is a lot of time, artists visit Münster again and again, and very often, you know, many of these pieces are deeply inscribed or, or anchored, you know, in this context. And it is a matter of fact, I mean, I will never forget, I once met an artist who told me that he spent a month in Marseille to do something on Algeria and Marseille and, you know, and... Uh, the same artist did something in Belfast about the Belfast problem at that time. And, you know, I happened to give a lecture in Belfast and I had a chat with a taxi driver and he told me that he'd been driving the taxi for 40 years and he still hasn't understood the conflict. You know, it took him 40 years and did something. So th this idea that an artist parachutes in and then within a month makes a site-specific comment on a context can also be, you know, very difficult. I think residencies are interesting. I mean, I think to some extent... Um, um, what we haven't spoken at all today about is the potential about, we've spoken about conferences, we've spoken about uh, formats of exhibitions, but I think, I mean, when I was a kid I got this, you know, residency very early on from the Cartier Foundation. And I arrived there and Absalon was on the left-hand side and Huang Yongping on the right-hand side, so two visionary artists, one from Israel, one from China, and it completely, you know, changed my life and it was an incredible setup to spend several months with these artists and, you know, in a dialogue, and I think there are very few such really great residency situations around in the world. And I think if one would really want artists to work in a context, there cannot just be a few short site visits, but there would then have to be an incredibly exciting residency situation, which would not be the residency situation artists feel obliged to stay and go away whenever, but which the artists feel so compelled to stay because it's so fascinating that they would really spend time. And then I think that out of such a residency situation, within an exhibition could probably grow very interesting things. So I think that might be, but it's a huge topic. Andre, you want to make a last concluding? Yeah. <laughs> it won't be concluding. Great idea. <laughs>